you know what? I'm gonna bite the bullet for a year. I'm gonna go play Challenge Tour again. I need to. I need to feel something. I need to. One, obviously, you need to get my game back to where it was, but I need to feel like I'm me again. I need to feel that player that won the Scottish Open, that player that won the SO, the Alfred Daniel, the Cape Town Open. There, that player wasn't in me. I needed to go and find it. And as Mr. Hogan said, champions are found in the dirt. And I needed yeah. to do reps. I needed to hit balls. I needed to play holes. I needed to figure out how the hell I was going to get my old self back. Well, hello, everybody. On the show with me today is South African professional golfer and three-time DP World Tour winner, Brandon Stone. And if you're interested in golf and if you are interested in what happens behind the scenes in the life of a touring golfer, then this episode is for you. What struck me most about my discussions with Brandon is gaining insight into what happens between tournaments. I think us as spectators and as fans of the game, we only generally have access to our favorite players from Thursday through to Sunday. And we tend to forget what goes through, what these players go through in terms of logistics and what it's like logistically to play in these professional events going across the world um, from Monday to Wednesday. And I think it takes a big toll on these players. And I think you might look at the career and the life of a professional golfer a little bit differently after listening to this episode. Brandon outlines his wins that he's had in his career so far, which was very interesting to track back and listen to that, as well as the ups and downs of being a professional golfer, having lost his European tour card in November 2022, and then making the decision to grind it out on the challenge tour in 2023, only to gain his and earn his DP World Tour card back the following season which is where he's now competing this year. And I have a challenge for you this episode. If you enjoyed it, and only if you enjoyed it, please share this with one extra person this week. Let's see if we can get some really good traction out of this episode and grow together as part of the Expect Performance community. That would be a massive help. And just on a sidebar, the episodes are coming out every two weeks as opposed to every week now, so every second Monday at 6 a.m. on all major podcasting platforms. That gives me enough time to prepare, to deliver the best possible episodes for you and to get the best possible guests. Thank you so much. Like, share, subscribe, and enjoy. Expect Performance Podcast, all the way from Amsterdam or the Netherlands. Yeah, how's it going, Clinton? Yeah, it's a... It's quite apt, actually, that we I'm doing it from my gym in Durban and you're doing it from your hotel room. You've got another DP World Tour event on the horizon mm-hmm. coming up on Thursday. And I'd like to chat a little bit today, Brandon, about the... First of all, let's start with an introduction, uh, your career so far, your amateur career, fast track you through into college golf, and then your career started to accelerate quite quickly from there to where we find ourselves now in 2024. So a little bit of an overview of your career so far, please. <laughs> an overview. Uh, <laughs> it's both extremely long and deceptively short. It does, time has flown. I mean, I'm now 31. So the fact that I've been on tour now for just over a decade is really fascinating to me because it's felt like a blink of an eye. Um I do see myself with a few more wrinkles. A few gray hairs have been pointed out to me by my lovely wife. So there is that. <laughs> but yeah, I've been very, very fortunate to have the career that I've had, to do the things that I've done and to play the tournaments and to kind of just see the world. I think I'm on country 48 I've done at the moment. And I think when we go to Korea at the end of the year, it's country number 49 around the world. So oh, awesome. I've been proud. <laughs> I've been traveling full time since I was about 16, 17 at the time with the junior national squads and amateur national squads. And now, uh, unfortunately, I'm doing it on my own dime. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so you've been traveling quite a bit then through your, through representing South Africa on an amateur Mm -hmm. level. You then moved on and you, and you spent some time at college golf. What was that experience like? Listen, I think, um, 
back when we were playing junior at amateur golf back in South Africa, there wasn't really this expectation to go abroad, especially to study. And we didn't quite have the golf RSA program in when I was kind of getting started. So everything was self-funded. I remember my parents, we would always have a, a fundraising golf day every year for me to be able to play just maybe three or four tournaments abroad, whether it be in the UK for the British Amateur or the state side for like the Junior World Championship at Torrey Pines or US Amateur. So my parents were always like fundamentally quite rigid in the perfect, in the point of view that my academics were always important. They knew that life is kind of more than golf. So I went to Cornwall Hill College from grade zero all the way through to matric. Um, in, in my matric year, I missed over 100 days of school with my traveling for my golf. So it was exceptionally difficult. But my mother being Desiree, like you know, she uh, assisted me like she does everything. And I managed to get over the line there. And the opportunity to go to college in, in the States presented itself. Um, Coach John Fields at the University of Texas got in contact with me through Dylan Fratelli, who was a mutual friend. And I got offered a full scholarship to go to, to Austin to represent the Longhorns. And it was kind of a no-brainer. We knew at the time I wasn't quite ready to turn professional. We knew that, in all honesty, we couldn't really afford for me to be uh, traveling the world full time as a professional because my family, we aren't trust fund babies. We don't have massive bank accounts. We are a working class family. And my parents worked tirelessly just to get me through amateur golf. So going over to America on a full ride, not having to pay for a meal or anything was, was massive to me and got over to the States and my eyes were just shocked honestly it was a different ball game um from the convenience of travel i mean we used to get we used to be sponsored by nike at texas and we used to get drops of when i say these massive boxes of clothing and gym apparel and golf gear. and if anything was an issue coach field used to take care of it if your golf shoes weren't the right fit were in size if your shirts didn't if you didn't like he took care of everything it was such a eye-opening experience for me because i'm just this kid from Rustenburg and this kid from that grew up in Centurion. I mean, I don't know any of this. Yeah. So, and then we go and every golf course that we're playing on is PGA to a standard. I mean, when I was a junior growing up, we were playing Bronco Sprite and we were playing Centurion. We were playing Silver Lakes and we we're playing, if you were lucky, you got to like a Serengeti or you got to something like a Durban country club for a Kazan and amateur. That, those were the tournaments. We're like, wow, we really pulled a, a fantastic venue. So, when it kind of when I got there, funnily enough, golf felt easy, if that makes sense, yeah. because you had nothing to worry about. You had everything was taken care of. You're playing on the perfect golf course every time that you would play, and I found myself having some some really good success quite early on. Yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly your results show that uh, golf came quite easily to you when you got <laughs> over there. Um, and and for those of the people listening that don't know, the the Longhorns are really one of the premium places to go and play golf in America. Mm. And I know that at the time, you know, the likes of Jordan Spieth was a, a teammate mm. of yours. So that, yeah. is the, that is the caliber of college golfer that we're talking about here. Um, and you rose to the occasion pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, funnily enough, um, we played our first tournament in, in Georgia. And uh, I played some, some great golf on a perfect golf course and I ended up winning. And it was so funny. So coach used to always have these kind of qualifying criteria with regards to getting into the next event. Because obviously within the team, only five guys can play every tournament, but there were 11 members of our squad. So we had to do qualifying events. And because I played the US amateur, coach gave me an exemption into the first tournament. And then he said, if you're top 10, you get exempted the following tournament. If you get a win, you get a three tournament exemption. And I was like, wow, that's quite cool. You know, obviously that's a fascinating carrot dangling in front of your face. And, but at the same time, I was kind of looking at it from the perspective, these guys must be good. I mean, you always hear about the juniors and the amateur golfers within the American kind of system. And you, you don't have to scroll very far down a leaderboard anywhere in the world to see the, the stars and stripes being fluttered on the leaderboard. Mm. So kind of got to that first tournament. I was like, okay, I kind of need to prove to coach that I deserve to be here. Like, and I played some unbelievable golf and managed to get a win. And I, I remember kind of weirdly, 
when we're on the plane flying back to Austin, I was like, I wonder if it's going to be this easy all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I played, honestly, I played some of my best golf when I was over that side. I was training really hard. We were working in the gym, working academically because in America, it's very big that you're a student before you're an athlete. So I was really getting into my studies, which is a nice distraction away from golf at times. And yeah, it was... It was a fan, like a fantastic year, but it was very fascinating to me because the biggest thing that I kind of picked up, I thought we would be playing more golf when we went over to college, but we only played, I think, 10 or 11 events over that nine-month nine month period. So I was kind of taken aback from that. But in saying that, we played 11 events and I won three of them. So sure. I was kind of from the perspective, I had this amazing season. And when it came to kind of the end of the season, to my fortune, I was getting offered these contracts by all these manufacturers, clothing lines and so on, because I was number two in the country, number one freshman. And I remember vividly like having conversations with my family and I was kind of like, it might be time to turn pro now because like I said earlier, we didn't have the finances for me to play professional golf abroad. So mm. now you're getting thrown these dollar symbols and you're like, well, if I if I sign, if I turn pro now and sign these contracts, I can afford to play professional golf for three, four, five years. And it takes that financial burden off of you. And I remember I kind of, I came home to South Africa and I said to my mom, I need to make my decision now before I go back to the States, because when I get back, I want to sit with coach and tell him well in advance, this is the situation. And we sat down in the, as a family and we thought it was the right time for me to turn pro. So we did just that. What year was that that you turned pro? Oh, I think it was 2012. I think it 2012. was May 2012, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And then speak to me then about that period post turning pro to then mm -hmm. eventually ending up with your first professional win. So my, my start was quite fascinating. I started, funnily enough, at the BMW uh, Championship in Munich, which is where we will be in a couple of weeks' time. And I finished top 10. I played great golf, got an exemption to the following week. Uh, <laughs> Ernie won that week, so it was like even more special. I think it was his last mm -hmm. European Tour win other than the Open a few years later. And I remember I got my paycheck for like 32,000 euros. And I was like, this is going to be the easiest occupation in the world. I'm going to decide whether I want to get paid. <laughs> In hundred or two hundred dollars or euro notes, it, I, I literally thought this is going to be the easiest thing. Much like I kind of did after that first win in college, and I ate a massive slice of humble pie following that. <laughs> I think I missed six cuts in a row afterwards. Got to went to Q school at the end of the year. Got to the final stage, made the cut, didn't get my card. So. It meant I went up to the challenge tour. And I remember at the time I was very disappointed in myself. I, feel like I felt like I deserved to be on the DP World Tour. I felt like I was good enough. And funnily enough, my dad actually told me that he bumped into Louis Oersthausen at a tournament somewhere. And Louis had asked about me. And he said, how's Brandon doing? So on and so forth. And my dad's like, no, he's got his challenge tour card for next season. And he's like, fantastic. It's the best thing that can happen to him. He'll grow more as a player on the challenge tour than he ever will anywhere else. And... Just missed out on my car the first season and then stayed on the challenge for the following season and had a great season. Had an unbelievable year, played some great golf, got to the final tournament. And the, at the time, the top 15 guys would get their, Q, their DP World Tour cards. And going to bed on the Saturday night, I was projected to be 15th. I was tied sixth in the event and I was projected to be the last man to get his card. So as you can imagine sleepless nights turning over the pillow up and at him drinking water 17 times just couldn't get a wink of sleep and the following day shot i think i shot 68 bogey free on the back nine came off the golf course and i saw that i was fifth alone and i was kind of like okay i think i've done enough i think i've done enough and there was only one player behind me on the leaderboard that could change anything. And that his name was Nacho Alvera, who obviously has won it many times on the DP World Tour now. And Nacho birdied 17. 
to go one shot behind me. And then on 18, you hold like a 30 footer in to make birdie to go to make me tied fifth now. Yeah. So now I had no idea because there's no, <laughs> there's no projections. The app wasn't up like it is now where you can kind of see where you are or kind of get a good rough estimate. I had no idea. So my dad and I, because my dad was with me, funnily enough, and we're standing outside the scorer's tent waiting for them to sign their scorecards because he was the last group. And as he came out, he came out, said something like, well played today, whatever. And then the last player, I can't remember who it was. I think it was a Ricardo Gouveia. He just came out of the scoring tent and gave me a big hug. And I was like, what, what's up? He's like, no, you made it. You're 15th card. And I just remember breaking down. I was like, this is incredible. My old man was in tears. I was in tears. We hugged for probably five minutes. Um, it's like this childhood dream that you've always had. But you, it felt different because you felt like you earned it. It wasn't given yeah. to you. You didn't play on invite. You, you felt like you deserved it. You, you, ground, you grinded away for two years on the challenge tour. And the challenge tour is called the challenge tour because it is just that. It is a challenge. It is difficult. It's expensive. You're playing crap courses. It's just in the middle of nowhere most of the time. You're traveling to the most odd countries like Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan and all these places that you've never heard of growing up in South Africa. But here you're playing your golf tournament. And I remember we flew home. My dad and I obviously had a few beers on the plane because now we're celebrating. <laughs> and I was... <laughs> Funny enough, I was entered into the Cape Town Open, which was the following week. And when we were flying, I said to my dad, listen, I don't think I can play this week. I'm shattered. Like, I've, I gave my caddy the rest of the year off. I said, but the ro emotional roller coaster we've been through, take the rest of the year off and I'll see you in January. And my dad's like, no, because he was entered into the tournament. He was going to play. So he's like, come on, we'll fly down on Wednesday play nine holes, take it easy, go to Cape Town, Cape Town's lacquer, we'll have a good time, and it'll just be a nice kind of breakaway. So I said, okay, cool, fine. True as nuts, I end up winning that week. My first ever professional tournament. <laughs> it was like all the expectations, all the pressure, playing kind of that, that week, I felt no pressure, no expectation. I'd done what I needed to have done the, year, the week before, and I got my first professional win. And it was just kind of like, wow, like, is this, is this what it's like? Yeah. Everything happening so quickly. And then, yeah. and then, and then that roller coaster continued to move quickly because it wasn't uh, two months later that you then won the SA open. Yeah, so, I mean, so, so, I mean, the roller coaster continues. It, it was so weird. So we had, we played Leopard Creek the following week. And I played nicely and I played decent. And I think I finished top 20, like 16th or something along those lines. And I remember when I was driving home, kind of said to my dad, listen, I don't think I can take time off. I feel like I'm playing really well. So if I take a break and don't practice and don't train over December, I might be a little bit rusty because SA Open at that time was literally the first week of yeah. January. I think we started like the 4th of January or something. So your practice round is basically New Year's Day. And he's like, okay, cool. Well, listen, just recover kind of really put the work in but look after yourself and i literally worked the whole of december didn't really go went to belito to see my folks for like maybe a week over christmas and while i was there still playing golf still practicing whatever so we get to the so open and i remember i shot one over par the first day and i was kind of a little bit disappointed in myself felt like i played better and my dad and i were driving back to my house and he's like you played really nicely today. I said, yeah, you know, I felt like I left a lot out there, but I feel like my game's good. And my old man said to me, and I'll never forget, he's like, you're still going to win this week. And I mean, this is a 21, 22-year-old kid. And I turned to him, and I was like, you really think I'm going to win? And he's like, yeah, 100%. Your game's there. You can win. And that mental shift that I had within me from feeling somewhat despondent kind of instantaneously just switched to, okay, cool, what do I need to do better tomorrow? And what I need to do, do a bet on Saturday. And it was such a tough week. We obviously, listen, Joburg in January, we had thunderstorms. We had to play, I think it was 25 or 26 holes on the Sunday. We went head to head with Christian Vesalo. And I remember I hold a beautiful putt on 16 in the par four, like a big swing, like 12, 14 foot, a big swing from left to right. Hold that to get like two or three shots ahead of Christian, make par on 17. 
and par on 18. And I remember I, <laughs> I had like a, it must have been 20 centimeter putt on the last, after my first putt, I've, I've literally ran up and marked it because I'm going, I am so jittery right now. But because the worst part is that the first putt that I had behind the green, they've got the trophy sitting, honest to God, three yeah. meters away from me from the back edge there. And I am absolutely shitting myself. I mean, that, <laughs> that championship I caddied for my dad so many times at Pearl Valley, Durban Country Club, we have, I've seen this trophy, I've heard about this trophy, it's, I mean, your National Open has so much sentiment in your heart, and I remember I looked up at it, and I just had to instantly look away, like, I was like, almost like looking at yourself in the mirror when you're feeling like you got a bad hair day, I just quickly turned, I was like, no, 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 we still got a job to do, we still need to kind of suss this out, and I remember I just tapped it in, collapsed, Tears were flowing before I'd even pulled the putter back. Now the tears are really going. And like people often ask me, what's my best memory in my entire career? And I remember walking off 18's green and my grandfather was walking down towards me. Yo, I'm even getting a little bit, little bit teary out now. My grandfather was walking down from the spectators and he just gave me a hug. And it was the pinnacle. The pinnacle of what I dreamed of since I was five years old, playing playing golf with the members that didn't want to play with me on a Saturday morning, to now hoisting the SA Open trophy. My greatest memory, not a shot, not a speech, not a trophy. It was walking off, giving my granddad a hug, walking to the scorer's tent, giving my dad a hug. And true as nuts, when I came out of scoring, there's Ernie. And he gave me the biggest hug. My golfing idol growing up, someone that my dad had played with as a junior golfer. No, that was that was that was the tops. Jeez, yeah, that's that's hard to beat, eh? Um, <laughs> but but you certainly you certainly tried your best to beat that because it wasn't before the end of the year that you then picked up another big victory at, at Leopard Creek at Alfred Dunnell. Um yeah. and, and your career continued to go from strength to strength. Yeah, I think listen, um, Winning at Leopard Creek is on every South African golfer's bucket list. Mm. It is the holy grail of golf in South Africa. And luckily, it was a little bit easier in some respects. Um, there wasn't really anyone chasing me. Shaul was chasing me going into Sunday, but he had a little bit of an oopsie on 15 while I'm standing on the tee box waiting and I'm like, okay, cool. What's going on? And anybody that's played Leopard Creek knows when you're standing on the 15th tee box, it's quite daunting. Like you, you can see why you might go astray there. But uh, 15, just, I was the there. Uh, yeah, second, right on second top. To oh the, yes, yes. yes the, elevated the, tee box. The par five right on top of the overlook, the whole lake behind yeah. the fairway there. The yes. whole, you're looking over the Kruger. It's beautiful. Yes. And, uh, so I managed to get through 15, get through 16, get through 17. And on 18, I'm walking up there. And I think I had a, a three-shot lead at the time. And anybody that plays Leopard Creek knows what Ernie's done on 18. Mm -hmm. We knew what he did. Every golfer knows. So I'm kind of like, <laughs> I remember so vividly, I said, I'm going to aim it up the right-hand side of the fairway, and I'm just going to smoke it. I'm going to try and turn it away from the river. If it ends up in the left rough, even better. There's no temptation to go at it. And I've got up and I've absolutely milked one. Turned off the right edge of the fairway, down the middle of the fairway. And now I'm sitting there, walking down to the fairway and I'm going, am I really going to go for this? Yes. <laughs> and yeah, now you're I've in that got... no man's land. That's why it's such a exactly. good par five, eh? Because it's like... You, do it's so, you, good. Do it's do so you... tempting. Yeah. And I mean, it's like really people don't understand like how pinpoint your approach shot has to oh. be there especially when you're even with the mid iron um oh. i mean it's like landing it, it on a postage stamp 100 percent. i mean you've probably got three to five square meters that you have to land that on out of that yeah. entire green everyone it says it looks big it ain't big you got mm. you got five square meters maximum and i remember we were walking down the field with my caddy at the time his name was chris and we get to my ball it is perfect it's middle fairway it's a flat lie the pin's back right and I said to him, how far we got? And he's like, you got 185 flag, but we're hitting it 85 yards to the front left of the thing. So I'm like, 185, I mean, that's a perfect seven iron. And I've gone to the bag to grab a seven iron. And he's put his hand straight on my hand. He's pulled out the lob work and he's got the front left edge <laughs> of the fairway. 
get up, lay it up to the front left edge of the fairway, hit a beautiful wave shot to like six feet and tap it into like one by four, I think it was. And again, awesome experience. It, it's, it's so surreal to win a creek. The tournament has so much history. The place is so spectacular. And to be a part of the list of players that has won there is really, really special. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Um, so on the subject of, of playing great golf, Brandon, mm. I, if I think of your career as a golf fan uh, and I had to think of a round that stands out to me, it's that final round at the <laughs> Scottish Open. A putt for, a putt yeah. for 59. A putt um, for 59. A 60 in, in, in the fourth round, which is a record on the European Tour. I'm not sure if it still is, but it was at the time. Um, yeah. And and by far your, the biggest win of your career. How, mm -hmm. Was that that round that sixty on the on the final day? Was that the best golf that you've ever played? Uh, probably not. Honestly, um, I mm. remember I sh that when I won Cape Town Open, I shot a sixty three, but in like a three club win. So I think that was probably better in that regard. Because Scottish Open was kind of weird. Cause there was so many, so going into Sunday, there were like thirty players within three shots. So no one had a clue who was going to win. Like you, you, you kind of teed up on the first tee box going, the weather was perfect. The golf course was perfect. You need to go. Like mm. birdies are winning. There's no <laughs> if, buts or babies. You're not shooting level par and walking away the championship. And my tee, Teague and my caddy at the time, we just said, we're going to go out there and play like we were playing a social round between, between each other. So we went for everything. We hit driver everywhere. <laughs> Got super aggressive. Hold some beautiful putts. I mean, on 16, the par five, I, there's a putt that everybody's seen with regards to my heart. It's massive swing down the big hill. Hold it for eagle. Got me into the lead at the time, which I had no idea. I had no idea where I was on the leaderboard. Tegan and I said we were not looking at the leaderboard. We're just going. Pedal to the middle. Top gear. Let's go. Made eagle there, made a good par in 17. 18 was somewhat drivable, but it was really tricky to kind of get the line right off the tee. So he's like, four eye middle fair, we're going to trust ourselves. He had a good wedge shot. I've been wedging a ball. And I wedged it to that putt that we all know at 12 feet. And when we were walking up to the green, obviously the spectators were kind of letting me know that I was in the lead or somewhere close to it. And there's obviously, like there is in any tournament, a massive scoreboard on 18's green. My playing partners, they were to the side, so they were going to go play their shots first. And I found myself kind of looking to the leaderboard, saw my name was on top, saw I think I was leading by two. So I was like, oh, wow, like today's really gone according to plan. And then <laughs> for some reason, which I never do, I found myself counting my birdies. So like, oh, we, wow, I'm, okay. I never really do that. So I was kind of like, you know, we made a few birdies today. Like, I wonder how many we've made. And counting the red and yellow dots. And I was like, oh, we, we're actually 10 under par. Like, if I hold this at 61, that'll be my lowest round as a pro. And then I turned away, kind of went, wait, the course isn't par 72. The course is par 70. And I looked at Tegan and I said, but... You know this putt for 59? And he looked at me, he's like, yes, I know this putt for 59. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, oh, shit. <laughs> I had no idea. And hit a good putt. Guess I misread it. Maybe a little bit too little pace. Dived in front of the hole. Signed for 60. And uh, was very fortunate to raise the trophy above my head a little later. Nice, man. There's something, uh, I, I think, to my career in, in, you know, being at the gym here. I'm 34, you know, you're uh, early 30s now as well. And <clears throat> I always operated under the assumption my professional career, and I think most people do when in their 20s, because it's kind of like the trajectory that things go at, that every year is always going to be better than the next. <laughs> you know? Yep. Yep. Uh, um, and, and it's and that's certainly w what I thought in my career. And then obviously there is that year when you're like, oh, actually, I think I'm a bit worse off this year than I was last year. Mm -hmm. This doesn't feel very good. And yeah. and and there's like that um, 
yeah, you've really got to, you've really got to take stock. And it seems to me like at that point in your career, you know, a massive, it must have just felt like things are just going to go from strength to strength. Mm -hmm. And, and they were going that way. And there's no reason that you should have thought otherwise. Yeah. But life gets in the way and life happens. And that wasn't the case. So let me ask you this firstly. Did you think, like I thought, did you think, oh, this is just going to keep getting better and better every single year until we are just like unreal? Yeah, I mean, listen, br to be brutally honest with you, I wasn't playing particularly great golf leading up to the Scottish Open. Yeah. So absolutely. there was a little bit of humility with regards to that going, listen, I've played incredible this week, but we've still got a lot of work to do. Um, I knew that I wanted to be better. I knew that in order to become better, you need to invest in yourself and your training, your practice, whatever the case may be. So obviously with that massive prize fund that I, I picked up, I kind of had the ability to kind of take a little step back and kind of assess what I saw the players around me do to take their game to the next level. And the one thing that I found common to be or common practice was everyone kind of lived abroad. And I brought it up with my wife and I said, listen, I think, I think we need to move abroad. We need to allow me to go, play more, but recover more as well. Because when, when you're traveling, you're spending so much time in, in transit, your flight, South Africa is not close to anything. Yeah. If we're going to be honest. So you're looking at a day's travel minimum to get anywhere. And my wife and I made the decision to move to London and we loved it. We honestly did. L London was a fascinating city. We didn't live in the city itself. We lived right on the outskirts, joined a very private club. Practice facilities were incredible. And yeah, it, it worked for a few years. I, I played some some lovely golf, got some good results. Unfortunately, didn't get another win. But, you know, safely keeping my card every season. Um, kind of just not going through the motions, but for lack of a better phrase, going through the motions, playing professional golf. You, you, you pick, you're playing good golf, solid, picking up your paychecks, paying the bills, going to the next week, which kind of is a little cycle that you kind of find yourself in at times. And then obviously COVID it. And then it became incredibly difficult to get abroad. So we were funny enough stuck in South Africa at the time with our apartment in London, which isn't cheap as anybody that's been to London knows. It's not, yeah. not an easy expense to kind of write off. And it became increasingly difficult for us to get abroad, to get back to Europe. We weren't really sure at the time of COVID if we were ever going to get back because nobody knew anything. The tour didn't have any tournaments. I had this department that I committed to a year lease on, and now we're five months. We're five months that we're not going to be there. So yeah, it was tricky. It was troubling because, like you said, I paid this massive investment within myself, but due to circumstances that are out of my control, the ability to kind of maximize those was limited. Yeah, yeah. And then, so then fast forward, we, we, we step out of COVID, mm -hmm. you get back on, you get back on track, you're competing a week in and week out. Then what happened after that, once the tour resumed and it was business as usual? Um, I would say, listen, the first year of COVID was exceptionally difficult. Like we had to do the COVID test three times a week, your hotel room, you weren't allowed to leave, cold food on your doorstep every evening. It wasn't great. Mm -hmm following season funny enough was worse so when <laughs> when we first came out of COVID, or when we came out of COVID and started playing everyone's policies were the same so everything was the same whether you're going to london whether you're going to spain or whether you're going every any, you knew you fly in do your test get your positive or negative result take it from there but in 2021 every country had different policies so your logistics became so incredibly difficult because Italy, you would have to do a test three days before. Spain, you'd have to do a test the day before. England, you'd have to do your three tests the week before. It became a logistical nightmare. So 
we moved back to South Africa just because we knew that we could control my travel. I could do my tests in South Africa. I could fly to where I needed to be and then do the respective tests or whatever they needed, loopholes that, or loops they needed me to jump through. And got through that, played decent, and then we got to the, the season where my exemption ended. So obviously when you win a tournament on the DP World Tour, depending on the size of the event is how long your exemption will, will run for. And I come to the end of my exemption with regards to my win from Scotland, that being the 2022 season or the start of that. So I knew, okay, cool. I have no exemption. I need to play well. And I just played terribly. Start of the year was fine. Got made a lot of cuts early on. No real results. Anytime you're, like, anytime you're finishing outside the top 30 in a tournament, you're not really picking up points. So you're not, you're not climbing the, the order of merit. You're not getting close on the race to Dubai, you're just sustaining more than anything else. And my golf game felt okay, but it didn't feel great. I felt like I was just, just playing, waiting for something to happen as opposed to controlling myself, controlling my game, controlling my ball and getting in for as few amount, few amount of shots as possible. So I remember coming back to South Africa, kind of not really happy with my game, but needed a little bit a couple of weeks off before I hit because we used to, we head out for a long stretch typically around August we go for seven eight sometimes nine weeks and I came back and it was my grandfather's 80th birthday at the time flew down to Derbs he lived in Scottsboro went there had a whole hullabaloo beautiful ceremony L- lovely to see them lovely to see my mom and my dad hadn't seen them for a few months it was great and that was the Saturday Flew back the Saturday night and Sunday morning, my dad phoned me and he's like, listen, you need to fly, You need to come to Durban. Something's happened to mom. So I said, what's happened to mom? She's like, we don't know yet, but she's not doing very well. You need to come and see her. So I said, say no more. Went home, packed a quick bag, went to the airport, got in the plane, flew home and I found out that my mom had a stroke. So I was supposed to fly out that evening, cancel, withdraw from the tournament that I was meant to go play. Literally sat by my mom's bedside for a couple of weeks. We are so lucky and so fortunate that she got the medical attention that she needed at the time. And she made a borderline full recovery. I mean, like, you know, Des, she just blows expectations out of the water. And that was like a massive shock to me kind of internally, it's like, wow, life being so fragile, what is golf really that important, blah, blah, blah. But eventually I needed to go back to work because <laughs> I had a job to do. I was sitting on the brink with regards to keeping or losing my tour card, got on the plane, flew off to Europe, and I can safely say I didn't want to be there. Yeah, didn't want to be there. I wanted to be with my mom. I wanted to help her. I wanted to make her feel better. It didn't help that I was playing crap golf. Missing cuts off the cut, off the cut, off the cut, off the cut. And long story short, I lost my card, lost my job, didn't play well oh. enough, lost the right to be on the DP World Tour. And that was hard because I didn't feel like I was a DP World Tour player. I didn't feel like I had the game to compete. I didn't feel like I was myself. I didn't feel like I looked in the mirror, didn't identify with the person that I was looking at. The decisions I was making on the golf course were amateur at best at times. My execution was terrible, but there was no way that going to Q school, I was going to get my card. Just no way. Like I knew my golf game, all I was doing was going to Spain for a week of torment. And yeah. So just for clarity yeah. to the listeners, you being a, having lost your card, you would go straight into stage three. You'd go to final stage mm. of, of yeah. the DP World Tour Q School. Okay, so you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you that that one week you were like, there's just no ways that there, I'm playing well just, enough there to, was to get just, to this. There was just no possibility with the golf game that I had and the mental attitude and the emotional state that I was in that I was going to get my card back. Any player that's gone to Q school knows it is the most brutal, nerve-wracking, under-pressure week you can have as a professional golfer. It is six rounds. 
a four round cut on tough courses in Spain in November. It the rain, it's cold, it's so challenging. And I just didn't have that in me. And I remember I missed the last tournament of the season, Portugal, because I, I, I literally said, I can't, I can't play. I, I won't be able to shoot on the par. So then why am I going to a golf course where you have to shoot 25 under to win? Because at the time, where I was, I would have needed a top five at least to potentially have kept my card. So flew home and chatted with my wife, chatted with my family and said, listen, I'm not going to go to Q school. I don't feel like I compete. I don't feel like I'm the player that I need to be. I need to go back to the drawing board. And they were like, oh, cool, cool. Well, what are you going to do? Because you're a professional golfer. Um, <laughs> so I said, you know what? I'm going to bite the bullet for a year. I'm going to go play Challenge Tour again. I need, to, I need to feel something. I need to, one, obviously you need to get my game back to where it was, but I need to feel like I'm me again. I need to feel that player that won the Scottish Open, that player that won the S Open, the Alfred Daniel, the Cape Town Open, they, that player wasn't in me. I needed to go and find it. And as Mr. Hogan said, champions are found in the dirt. And I needed yeah. to do reps. I needed to hit balls. I needed to play holes. I needed to figure out how the hell I was going to get my old self back. And spent the whole of December grinding away, hands bloodied and blistered, back was in stitches. I was so, in so much pain every day, but I knew that this is what was required for me to get back to where I was. And uh, went back to the Challenge Tour. Obviously, we're very fortunate being South Africans that we have so many Challenge Tour tournaments in South Africa. Got off to a decent start, played nicely in a few of them, got some points up, was in the top 20 because they extended the uh, 20 cards, we, 20 guys with their card and played the whole season of the Challenge Tour. I knew how crap it was when I did it the first time. I didn't need to be reminded about it when I went back. It is still the same. It's still challenging. There's a lot more professionalism with regards to organization standpoint, but it is brutal. If you're making a cut and you're not finishing anywhere close to the top of the leaderboard, you're picking up a couple thousand euros where your expenses are more. Yeah. And you just... What, what, if, you had to, if you had to average it out, what's a, what's a break-even finishing place on the challenge to so challenge tour varies a little bit just because not a lot of guys actually take caddy. So I take a caddy. My, mm. my, my caddy came with me from the end of the DP season. He said he's following me to the challenge tour and he was on a thousand dollars a week. Your hotel, you're looking at a minimum of a hundred dollars a night. So that's another 700 food. You're looking at around between 30 and $50 a week. So there's another 300. So you had $2,000 there before you've rented a car, which you need to do most weeks before you go for one fancy dinner where you might have a bottle of wine or a beer, beer, all of that's just exceptionally expensive. So you, I would say you're averaging very close to $3,000 a week and $3,000 on the challenge tour is probably top 20, maybe top 15, depending on the tournament. And I mean, there's a, there's a serious golfers on the challenge tour. I mean, it's 100%. not like you can just... It's not like you can just rock up there and walk into a top 20. I mean, there's a proper, proper golfers. I mean, listen, in any professional sport around the world, the toughest guys to beat are the most desperate. Mm. And the guys that are on the Challenge Tour are desperate to be on the DP World Tour because there's guys that have won on the DP Tour, like myself, that are there. And there's also the 18, 19-year-old kid that I was when I first did it who's now coming yeah. through. So there's such a mixture of potential professionals and up and coming professionals and guys that have done it, who've got that experience, but feel like they're better and they shouldn't be here. It's like this whole intermingle of these characters, which is so fascinating. Mm. And weirdly enough, it's so social on DP to the PGA to especially everyone's like a chartered accountant. You get in, you do your work and you leave the office. Whereas on the yeah. challenge tour, everyone's staying in these crappy hotels in these small remote towns that you have to be social with everyone. So the camaraderie between not only the South African boys that we kind of found ourselves having, but everyone, everyone kind of gets along with everybody. Everybody, everybody love everybody as Ted yeah. Lasso would say. <laughs> and, uh, we kind of, it was very, I don't want to say relieving, but it, it was a lovely change of pace for me. Because I am a very social person. I love to see people, especially my friends. I love that social interaction, that kind of slapstick humor, 
being able to kind of have a little chirp at someone and they chirp back at you and that little interaction, that's nice. That's kind of what whereas on the main tours, you don't really get that. You don't get that too often. And I could feel myself being a little bit more at ease when I was on, on the challenge tour, which is, was both fantastic, but at the same time was a little bit worrying because you didn't want to get comfortable there. You're obviously trying to get away yes, from it. Yes, yes. So yeah. there's that, that, you're on that knife's edge with regards to where it can go. And long story short, played great again. Finished top 10 a few times, no wins, a couple second places. And I found myself having deja vu again. It was horrible. Projected rankings, Brandon, going into Sunday, 19th. Second last card. Amazing. I think I was 7th on the leaderboard. So I've gone, okay, need, you know, need to play well tomorrow. Anything can happen. There's so many points on, on offer in the, the final tournament. Got out there, played lovely. Really hit some good shots, made a few putts. But... I three put the last. And now I look at the leaderboard, obviously dropped a few places, and I think I was eighth or ninth now. And now my head's running. And now I'm starting to panic. Because now everything that I can control is gone. Yes. All the control was of that. Now I'm up to the mercy of the boys that are on the golf course, and I think I was fourth or fifth last group. So there's a lot of guys behind me. <laughs> and... I remember saying to Chase, my caddy, I can't do this. I'm going to the locker room. I'm going to go lie down on some towels. Get me a beer. That's all I want. <laughs> He's like, don't worry, boy. I'll be there now. <laughs> I go to the locker room. Don't even turn my phone on because I don't even want to look at the leaderboard and the yeah. projected rankings. Because now with technology, there's projected rankings. And <laughs> the, lot, the few boys that have... I've chatted to you from the scoring tent to the locker room have told me, yes, Bruce, it's going to be tight. You up and down and up in and out of this. And I'm going, that's the last thing I want to hear right now. <laughs> I just need some tranquility. And went to the locker room, Chase and I sitting there having a beer. And we heard the last guy come in because you can obviously hear the spectators on the 18th green going ballistic when he wants. And Chase and I simultaneously grab our phones out of our pocket, turn them on, Look at the rankings, 19th. We've done it again by the skin of our teeth. Then we're having more beers <laughs> and more beers and more beers. And the celebration of kind of we did it, whatever. But we obviously have the function that night. Everybody's, the beers are flying. We're having a great time. I say to Chase, but I'm knackered. I need to go back to my hotel room. He says, I'm the same. I'm finished. And I remember... I walked into my hotel room, took my shoes off, sat on my bed, and I just started bawling, completely bawling my eyes out. There wasn't a person around me. I didn't phone anyone. I didn't speak to anyone. I just sat there crying my eyes out because, and I remember so vividly, I sat there and I said, holy shit, I did it. Mm. And I looked at myself in the mirror because it was one of those hotels where the, where the cupboards had the mirrors on. I looked up and there's myself in the mirror. And I recognized myself. And I said to myself, that's me. I recognize yeah. this player. I'm back. Mm -hmm. I'm the Brandon that I wanted to be a year ago. Didn't like what I saw. Couldn't recognize, recognize myself. I looked up and I went, there he is. I'm back. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a wonderful story, man. But it's also, I think people can take lessons from that. In, in the sense that sometimes the... Uh, well, very often the easiest route is not the best route. You know, the road less traveled. Mm. You decided to to delay potentially gratification. You decided to go back mm -hmm. and pay your dues for a year. Um, and 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 financially, you know, you've mentioned the yeah. financial impl implications of being on the challenge tour. It certainly wasn't a, a financial decision that drove that because no. you knew that you. That you knew that you were in for for however many um, hundreds of thousands to cover mm -hmm. yourself through that and carry yourself throughout that challenge to a season, but mm -hmm. in doing so, you've taken the long stance. You've taken a long term view, and you've tried to work on Brandon and Brandon as a person yeah. outside of golf, and and then and then Brandon the golfer as well. And it seems mm -hmm. like you've come on the other side of that and you've a better person and a better player for it. So hopefully 
bringing us to the current moment that's <laughs> stand that's standing you in good stead to to have a real another good crack at, at the DP World Tour now. Are you yeah, feeling 100%. good about your your game and where you're at now? Yeah, very much so. Um, I'm playing lovely. Uh, got to see, play a few tournaments this season that we didn't have on the schedule a few years ago. We were in Japan a few weeks back, China again. Uh, went back to India for the first time in a few years, which was lovely. The golf course there is brutal, but enjoyable in the brutality of it. Um, but yeah, I've had some good results. I think I've got two or three top tens this year already, which is nice. Obviously, you want to win. Obviously, you, you kind of strive towards that. So I'm still working really, really hard. Today was a long day. Got back to the hotel, went to gym. As we finished in, came and had a chat with you. So it worked out well in the timing with that. Um, but yeah, we've got a long haul of tournaments now. I'm out for five weeks. I go to Italy next week, Munich the following week, and then two weeks in America. I'll come home to South Africa for probably eight to ten days. And then got back onto the road again for another five, six weeks stint. So there's a lot of golf to be played. But I'm very happy with how the first six months have been. Yeah. Brandon, speak to me about the, we were chatting off air uh, about mm. the travel and, and how difficult it is as a South African, particularly, you know, mm -hmm. we, we are on the arse end of the planet um, when it comes to <laughs> traveling and, yeah. and, and getting to these different golf tournaments. But mm -hmm. as a spectator, as a, as, a, as a lover of the game, you know, I see and I watch golfers Mm -hmm. On a Thursday, a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday. And <laughs> yeah. then from Monday to Wednesday, I have no idea what they get up to if they're not my clients. And Bob's your uncle, they pop back up on your TV screens again and the following mm -hmm. Thursday. And that, what happens between TV time? <laughs> <laughs> People don't realize how difficult it is, man. It's crazy. Yeah. It's brutal. Listen, I mean, we're in Amsterdam this week, and I can honestly say... I haven't seen the town yet. It's now Tuesday evening. Um, so yesterday I arrived. I think our plane landed at 1.30, 1, 1.45, something like that. We waited for an hour and a half for our luggage, uh, as you typically do for some reason. So got my luggage at 3 o'clock. Got to the hotel a little bit later. We're very fortunate this week, actually, because our hotel that we're staying is in the airport. Yeah. And the golf course is five minutes away, which is the luxury we don't have all the time super convenient and every player loves it um but yesterday i went to gym after gym we went and funnily enough ate at a restaurant in the airport because we were too lazy to go anywhere because we knew we had an early morning this morning today was up at six got to the course at 6 30 did my warm-up got to the range at seven teed off at eight played nine holes finished my nine hole practice or nine holes of practice at 10 went to grab the quick bite to eat Went back out, was practicing from 10.30 to 3.30. Got back in the bus, or got back to my hotel just after 4. Had 30 minutes to lie in my bed and watch some YouTube videos. Went to gym. Went to gym for an hour, do my recovery stuff and a little bit of weight stuff, kind of just to maintain everything. Hopping on a call with you now for a bit. And then after this, I'll probably go eat in the foyer or the reception with a few other guys. We'll get to bed as soon as possible. Up at six tomorrow again. Practice around at eight o'clock tomorrow again. I'll do my practice. Probably get out of there probably three o'clock, three to four, something along those lines. Come back, go to gym, do my recovery, do a little bit of stuff to maintain everything. I'll come back to my room, do my little compression boots and my back brace, kind of get the body recovered. Go downstairs or maybe go into town if we're lucky for a dinner. Come back, be in bed by 8 30, 9 o'clock. Wake up the next morning for my 9 o'clock tea time. And then, and then we it, go. And, and then, then it's go. go time. Yeah. And then it's go time straight away. Yeah, oh, man. It's, it's crazy. Eh? People don't realize the, um, the life of a golfer on tour. Hey? But I'm glad that you, you were candid enough to give me a breakdown of what the last few days have looked like for you. Exactly. But I mean, <laughs> like I was saying to you with regards to this week being so convenient, we have weeks that are so inconvenient. Uh, a few weeks ago when we were in Hamburg for Germany, the golf course is quite isolated in where it is. So we were staying 45 minutes away. Do the whole prep very similar, much like I have the last few days. Get my tea time for Thursday and I'm teeing off at 2.30 in the afternoon. Because obviously the sun goes down so late here in summer. 
So I'm like, okay, cool, perfect. Wake up on Thursday morning to find out that there's a three-hour delay. So I'm like, well, that's not great. Eventually, 11 o'clock rolls around, and I'm like, I cannot be in this hotel anymore. I'm going to go to the golf course and do something. I need to go do Mm. something. I can't just sit here. Go to the golf course, mess around a little bit, have some lunch, talk a little bit of cock with the boys. Eventually, do my warm-up, get onto the golf course. We walk off the golf course because of bad light at 9.27 in the evening. Jeepers. I got in a car at 9.45. I got back to my hotel room at 10.30. Luckily, my roommate, Yaku Prinsu, had got me dinner, thankfully, because I didn't have time to do all of that. The next morning, we were restarting at 7.30. Jeepers. Quick so turnaround. The f- the 4 a.m. alarm was brutal the next morning. <laughs> brutal. <laughs> get up at 4.30, get a courtesy card, or get a courtesy card, 4.30 rather, 45-minute drive, get there, quarter past five. It has been torrentially raining overnight. Completely. The course is flooded. Four-hour delay. Yeah. I'm like, okay, so now I was restarting at 7.30, so now we're restarting at 11.30. Fantastic. Perfect. Go and restart my round. No real fireworks. Quickly go back into the clubhouse, have a quick bite to eat. We've got a 20-minute turnover between tea times, between me finishing my first round and starting my second round. Off we go. Playing again. Hit five balls on the range, five putts, and let's go to the. <laughs> let's go try and do this. Play, 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 play. Not really particularly playing that great, but, you know, on the cut line. Missed a birdie putt on the 8th hole, my 17th hole. Missed a birdie putt on the ninth hole. Look at the projected cut. I'm plus two. The projected cut's plus one. But there's like five or six guys that could potentially move it to plus two. But now, obviously, they're not finishing their rounds. Oh, no. (laughs) So now you have the suspense of this the entire evening because you're going, there's still a 5, 10, 15% chance that you can make the cut here. Yeah. So that night, you're doing your recovery, doing your whole preparation, the whole slap, bang, shabu, whatever. Go to bed. Day restarting at 7.30 again. Wake up at 7.30. Watch the guys make par home and you missed the cut by one. <laughs> and you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. it's brutal, brutal. Jeepers, man. But that's a. Uh, oh, I actually love how that's a. Uh, that's a wonderful way to wrap it up. Before we before we finish off, Brent, what are yeah. you excited about for the second half of twenty twenty four? Second half of twenty twenty four. Um, listen, I think the allure of wanting to play good golf is obviously the simple answer. Mm. Um, I do feel like it, the game is there to potentially get some good results. Just need to kind of stay patient more than anything else. But the goal is to constantly and continually feel like I belong here because I do. I have the game, I have the potential, and I have the capabilities of playing and competing with the best players in the world week in, week out. And as professional sportsmen, that strive for consistency is what we all look for. I'm still developing my routine and my kind of makeup to what makes me play my best. So... My goal for the rest of the year is to kind of just keep on developing that, kind of find out what makes me tick and makes me makes me perform on a weekly basis. But I think overall, I just want to enjoy it. I'm so fortunate to be doing what I'm doing. I've dreamt of being on the DP World Tour since I was a kid. I've dreamt of playing some of the tournaments like I'm playing since I was 10, 11, 12 years old. And I'm... I'm very blessed to do what I do. And in 2022, I lost sight of that. I lost sight of the life that I had, the opportunities that I'm presented with on a weekly basis. I can change my life this week. I can change my life next week or the week after. So if I can kind of just continually or continuously appreciate where I am, appreciate the opportunities that I've provided for myself, and yes, if some good golf comes my way, I'll be a very happy man. Yeah, what a wonderful way to finish it. Brandon, thanks so much, man. I appreciate you taking the time and good luck this week. Good luck. Thank you, big guy. Appreciate it.